Oklahoma and Texas are joining the SEC sooner rather than later. What does this mean for our Missouri Tigers? Plus, Missouri taking on Tennessee and my thoughts on Mr. Brightside, all this and more right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And of course, with Super Bowl 57 coming up this weekend, no better time than the present. But I'll tell you, Missouri Tigers got some big news last night. The whole SEC world did, in fact. Officially now, Oklahoma and Texas will be joining the SEC after next season's ac academic year. So after 23-24, the 24 summer, if you will, well, it'll be official, Oklahoma and Texas joining Missouri once again in the same conference. So what does this mean for Mizzou football and basketball? Well, let's start off with the gridiron because, well, that's probably the biggest question mark is scheduling. How is this all going to shake out? Well, Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, is basically all but confirmed the divisions are going away. We're going to a single division model for SEC football. The question is, Will it still be an eight-game schedule where you have one permanent rival and then actually seven teams each and every year will trade out? So no more playing Georgia and Florida and Kentucky, et cetera, every year. Presumably, Missouri would still play Arkansas every year. I think that's a fairly safe assumption that under that eight-team model that Missouri would still play Arkansas on an annual basis during the battle line slash Ozark Bowl rivalry. But you know what? I think the other model is much more likely. While I think the eight-game model is advantageous for Missouri because, number one, I think obviously just eight games versus nine in the SEC, well, Missouri has barely been bowl eligible the last couple seasons. So obviously on the margins – going to be a little bit easier of a schedule with one more non-conference game as opposed to a conference game in most seasons, all things being equal. And also, with seven games rotated each and every year, you're also going to get a more diverse schedule. You're going to see more teams come through for row field each season, and as a season ticket holder, there's a lot of appeal to that for me and all of us out there who go to these games, I'm sure. But I got to say, when you really look at it, I think the nine-game schedule is much more likely because, number one, the Big Ten is already there. And, you know, we've heard their fans, that conference, acting like, well, we play more games than you, so blah, 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 blah. I don't know that that's sort of smack talk or, you know, peer pressure or whatever you want to call it. I don't think that's going to move the SEC one bit. But what I do think will move the SEC is, well, what has been moving all of sports recently, and that's the TV dollars, especially when it comes to streaming services that have been thrown around a ton lately. I just think you've seen, you've seen Major League Baseball expand its playoffs. The NFL expanded its playoffs. The NBA now has its round robin, not round robin, excuse me, the play-in tournament for all intents and purposes to now – it's expanded the playoffs as well. NCAA tournaments talking about expanding. College football playoffs have already expanded. Well, what's the next logical step here? If you're the SEC, what's the next logical step? Well, it's to go to nine games and match the Big Ten. And guess who's going to want that? ESPN, whoever your, your partner is, Disney, whoever the heck it's going to be. I, I just think it's inevitable that that's where we're going. So what does that mean? 
Well, that means six rotating opponents and three permanent opponents. So Missouri would almost certainly, again, play Arkansas on an annual basis. The other two would be up for grabs. If you read the tea leaves, I think a Missouri-Oklahoma annual rivalry is pretty likely. I really do. I think the SEC in general likes the idea of the history of Missouri and Oklahoma have there and to sort of rekindle that for the new guys, Oklahoma. I think that's pretty likely. The third team, uh, frankly, is anybody's guess. I, I really have no idea there. Could be Kentucky, Vanderbilt, anybody. South Carolina, probably one of the teams that Missouri has played in the SEC East the last few seasons, the last decade, really, I should say. But ultimately, who Missouri's third permanent opponent is going to be in football is not going to be at the top of the Southeastern Conference's priority list. So really, Missouri could end up with anybody there as that third team. Ultimately, though, again, while nine games versus eight, on, on one hand, that's more entertaining, right? Give me another SEC game on the schedule versus, you know, Abilene Christian. Certainly from an entertainment perspective, I'm more happy with that. No question about it. But at the same time, there is an argument to be said that eight games, well, you'd actually get to see a, a wider variety and diversity of opponents, and it actually might be a little bit easier on Missouri as a program. But at the same time, I just think dollars and cents, looking at where the media landscape has gone in sports, I think ultimately the nine-game SEC schedule is inevitable, and I'd be really shocked if it went to the eight-game model. Now, obviously, football has been the focus of all the scheduling speculation, but obviously the Sooners and the Longhorns joining the fold means that the basketball schedule is going to have to change too. But really, if you think about it, the basketball schedule really doesn't have to change all that much. For one thing, Oklahoma and Texas, well, number one in football, if you're going to do the eight-game schedule, this is something I should have mentioned. Another plus with the eight-game schedule Logistically, it's so much easier to implement. I, I do think the dollars and cents will ultimately win out for the nine game. But just in terms of logistics, well, Oklahoma and Texas can come in, be their own permanent rival, and guess what? Now, all these teams that have, for whatever reason, scheduled non-conference schedules some 10, 20 years out in some cases – well, they don't have to change everything and pay out a bunch of money and find new opponents that may be less than ideal. So again, for basketball, though, Oklahoma and Texas can come in, for instance, and immediately be added to Missouri's basketball schedule with really out any difficulty whatsoever because, well, Missouri this year played five games or I should say 10 games against five teams. They had five teams that they played twice and eight teams that they played once for a total of 18 games. Well, all you have to do there is just, instead of playing against five teams twice, home and away, well, just play three teams, home and away, and add Oklahoma and Texas to the schedule. Easy peasy, no problem. That's, that's a pretty easy logistic thing to figure out there. However, once again, I think, I think of course, that once again, we're going to add two more conference games. I think that's an inevitability. I think the Big Ten already plays 20 conference basketball games versus the 18 for the Southeastern Conference. I think it's a real distinct possibility that, well, the schedule basically stays the same. You just play two more games now with Oklahoma and Texas being added to the schedule. Again, dollars and cents, Disney, Fox, etc., they want as many properties as they can get. That's the world we live in. So to me, just like football, I think it's inevitable that basketball expands their schedule a little bit in the conference as well. And speaking of college hoops, Missouri with a real tough one tomorrow in Knoxville, though I do think Tennessee has some vulnerabilities that Missouri could potentially exploit. So let's talk about how the Tigers can pull an upset tomorrow in Knoxville, but you know what? This year, the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Of course, we're really excited to have FanDuel on board here at Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat 
first bet, well, you'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. And, of course, with Super Bowl 57, they've got so many different things you can bet on. The MVP of the game, hey, Chris Jones at 50-1. to That's a pretty interesting bet, in my humble opinion. If you're looking for a, a true long shot, but you know what? Just the Chiefs sitting at one and a half point underdogs the whole couple weeks here has been surprising. I'm surprised the line hasn't moved at all. But you know what? No matter what your opinions are, you got to check out the FanDuel Sportsbooks app, which is safe, secure, and easy to use, and you get paid instantly on your winnings. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash Locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports book sponsor of the NFL. Thanks again for making Locked On Mizzou your first listen every day. Make sure to check out Locked On's brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college hoops in one place. Plus, hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches. And players, too. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And, well, after the dust settled during the midweek games here, Missouri is now tied for fifth place in the SEC, tied with Florida and the resurgent Arkansas Razorbacks at 6-5. and Arkansas has won five in a row, actually, in conference after losing In Columbia, the Razorbacks also a close loss to Baylor recently as well. So things have certainly turned around in Fayetteville. But you know what? Missouri just a game back of the all-important fourth spot in the SEC. And you know what? If they beat Tennessee tomorrow, they'll just be a game back behind the Volunteers, believe it or not. But obviously that's going to be a real tough assignment for Missouri tomorrow. Tennessee actually has the number one rated defense in the country and by a pretty comfortable margin as well. The Volunteers are really impressive on that end of the court. And in SEC play so far, they're just as good, quite honestly. So a tough assignment once again for Missouri. But if there is a vulnerability for Tennessee defensively, I got to think it's at the top. You got... Number one, Santiago Vescovi is a nice offensive player. I think he can be exploited a little bit defensively. And Zakai Ziegler, kind of the same thing. The guy's five foot nine, 171 pounds. I just think if you start putting him in pick and rolls with Kobe Brown or Noah Carter, well, Tennessee's going to have a bit of a bind there defensively because what are they going to do? Are they going to switch that screen and attempt to? Guard Kobe Brown with a defender who's a foot shorter than him? Do you double the ball and hedge hard and leave Kobe Brown, who's been an excellent three-point shooter this year, do you leave him open? Well, if Tennessee decides to do that, I think that might actually be a path to a Missouri upset. Because if you watched the game in Nashville the other night featuring Vanderbilt and Tennessee, well, you may have noticed Liam Robbins, Vanderbilt center, hit some early three-pointers in the game, and I think maybe Kobe Brown and Noah Carter can exploit some of those pick and pops. Looks like a slight vulnerability to me for the Volunteers. Really, Tennessee does such a good job of just playing team defense and basically clogging up the paint if you don't space the floor well. I really think that Missouri is going to need to beat their guards off the dribble one-on-one with with some consistency or it's probably going to be a long night. And to that point, if Isaiah Mosley doesn't play, I think Missouri is in deep, deep trouble. And if he doesn't play pretty well, even if he does play and just doesn't play poorly, maybe shows a little bit of rust, whatever it might be, well, I think Missouri, again, is in deep, deep trouble. I think Mosley is going to have to play well because we need his playmaking in this game because you can't just pass the ball around the perimeter and, and expect expect things to happen against Tennessee. I think you are going to have to be able to play some one-on-one action, especially at the end of the shot clock against the Volunteers. That's just how I see it, and that's how much respect I have for them defensively. Now, offensively, they're a solid team. 
I would say. They're good. They're not great. They're not as good offensively as Missouri is, just objectively. So if there is a vulnerability here offensively, maybe the Volunteers have a bit of an off night shooting. Again, just an average team in terms of three-point shooting. If Missouri can force them into some three-pointers that they maybe don't want to take and the Tigers maybe have a hot night on the road shooting like they did in Oxford, Mississippi a while back, Des Moines Hodge obviously is kind of the barometer for Missouri. Get him going early. Tigers have a chance in an upset, though I certainly wouldn't pick it or predict it. And coming up this year, the killer song, Mr. Brightside, has certainly become a tradition all of a sudden at Faro Field in Mizzou Arena. Well, to the consternation of some fans. Some fans don't like the profane nature of the chant that accompanies that song. So what do I think about it? Well, let's talk about that right after these quick messages. When the Cyclones came to Mizzou Arena a few weeks back, I have to say I'd almost forgotten how nice Iowa State fans are. What is it in the water up there in Ames? Those people are just delightful, in my opinion, at least from my limited experience. And I have to say I was amused when during the Mr. Brideside playing, which again has become an, a, a game, a, a tradition at every Mizzou game here this season. Well, the Iowa State people were into it. The people I saw behind the bench for the Cyclones in particular were very much into the FKU part of the, the song where the students chant and, well, whoever else wants to chant along as well. A nice moment of unity, I thought. But at the same time, I, I am sympathetic to people who think that it's a little bit much to every single game be having sort of that level of a profane chant. I, I really do sort of get that, especially as I get older. But at the same time, the alums aren't really doing it. It's not as though the entire crowd is being instructed to chant along to this by the PA announcer. Now, I know I'm sort of trying to win on a technicality here, right? But really more to the point, I think part of the student experience is acting the fool a little bit, being a little bit crazy, being a little bit naughty, kooky, even profane at times. I don't know. To me, that's just part of the college experience. And I got news for you. If you're about to send one of your kids to Mizzou or any other college out there, there's going to be some behavior going on that you don't necessarily approve of. Sorry, <laughs> if you want to send your kids to college, this is reality. Again, I, I, I do understand why people find it distasteful, but in my opinion, I think it's mostly lighthearted. I don't think it's really, it's not like there's true anger behind the, the FKU chant or whatever. And again, since it's just mostly the students who are getting into it, Listen, who am I to judge? I'm a 40-year-old man now, and I don't chant along to that particular thing. But if I were in the student section as I were, as I were a couple decades ago, as I was a couple decades ago, I guarantee you I would have been chanting right along with them. So who am I to judge? Plus, on top of that, I just think, listen, it's been until last season, it had been 10 years since Missouri had played Kansas in anything. We still haven't played them in football in that amount of time. So indoctrinating the newbies and the youngsters into the KU rivalry and the KU hate is a good thing, in my opinion. And to me, it's just all part of the fun. I don't know. It also sort of reflects our society a little bit, too. I mean, human beings are interesting when it comes to language. Sometimes there are words that, that are taboo for one generation that sort of fall off and then become relatively acceptable to say. And while then there are older words, which were absolutely accepted by everybody, that suddenly become taboo for the new generation. So my point is, we just saw LeBron James break the all-time NBA scoring record and punctuate his little speech with an F word. So I don't know. I guess this just reflects the society where we are right now for better or for worse. All I know is if Desiree Reed Francois is okay with it and the people at Mizzou are just happy seeing the, the students have some fun, make some noise, get into it, I, I'm okay with it if they are. And I'd like to thank most people, even if you find it a little distasteful, like 
eh, okay, so it's not for me. These kids are just being kids. It is what it is. I, I don't think it's something that Missouri fans should really get up in arms about whatsoever. But that's just me. But hey, guess what? I'm going to have lots more opinions for you coming at you on Locked on Mizzou in the coming weeks. Big time basketball heading down the stretch here in February and of course into March Madness as well. I'll be covering every moment for you right here on Locked on Mizzou.